Alrighty, in this video we're going to review the 2018 IGCSE physics paper from the May-June series. And we're going to be looking at paper 4 specifically, the longer answer section. So let's start off with a speed versus time graph and we want to calculate the acceleration at 30 seconds. Okay, so First of all, to get acceleration from a speed time graph, you need to know what the gradient of the graph is, and we need to know the gradient at 30 seconds. So to find the gradient at a point, what you need to do is draw a tangent to the graph at the time you're interested in, so 30 seconds. We then need to find the gradient of that graph. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm finding the change in speed and change in time. And gradient will be change in speed divided by change in time gives us a value of 0.38 meters per second squared to two significant figures. Okay, so that's our acceleration. Okay, so without further calculation, state how the acceleration at time 100 seconds compares to acceleration at 10 seconds. And suggest in terms of force a reason why any change has taken place. So, first of all, the acceleration, remember, is the gradient of the graph. And as time increases, the gradient of that graph is decreasing up to 100 seconds. So if the gradient is decreasing, that means acceleration is decreasing. So using F equals MA, that means resultant force is decreasing. And then why might the resultant force have decreased? Well, it's probably because as an object goes faster, air resistance increases, so that's why the resultant force would decrease. Okay, so the diagram shows a speed time graph for a vehicle accelerating from rest. Determine the distance traveled by the vehicle between 120 seconds and 160 seconds. So distance traveled is the area under the graph. So the area that we want is the one I've highlighted in red. That is a trapezium, and to find the area of a trapezium, you do half, half times the sum of the sides, it's basically the average of the sides, times by the base. Uh, so we've got the two sides, we've got the base, and we calculate that as 1,000 meters or one kilometer. Okay. So moving on to a different question concerning a forklift truck lifting a box. It's lifted using an electric motor powered by batteries. What form of energy is stored in batteries? Well, it's chemical potential energy. And we need the word potential in there because it's a form of stored energy, so we should be calling it potential energy. The lifting mechanism raises a box of mass 32 kilograms through a vertical distance of 2.5 meters in 5.4 seconds. Calculate the GPE gained by the box. So a uh, change in GPE would be the weight force times the change in height. Uh, so we're going to do its mass 32 times by G, which has the value of 10, times by the height change of 2.5 gives us 800 joules. If its efficiency is 65% or 0.65, calculate the input power. So first of all, what I'm going to do is calculate the output power here, or the useful power, if you like. So we, we do 800 joules of work in 5.4 seconds. That gives us our power in watts. But if it's only 65% efficient, we're going to have to do more power than that. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our power, divide by 0.65, and that will give us the actual power we would have to put in, and that would be 230 to two significant figures. So the batteries are recharged from a mains voltage supply that is generated in oil-fired power station. By comparison with a wind farm, state one advantage and one disadvantage of running a power station using oil. So the main advantage of oil is you don't depend on the weather. Wind turbines only work when it's windy. So oil is more reliable because we can demand it whenever we want. So um, a few people for this question put that oil gives more power than wind, um, but you're given no indication of the size of the wind farm. Actually, we can build wind farms which provide more power than an oil power station. So that's really not a valid answer here. It's the dependency on weather that's really the difference. 
And the disadvantages of oil, uh, burning oil produces CO2, uh, which is a greenhouse gas and contributes to global warming. Uh, burning CO2 also produce, produces pollutants like nitrogen dioxide, which, um, which can cause issues as well. And oil is non-renewable, so it will not be replaced by nature within a human lifetime sort of time scale. Okay, so we've got a regular container with base dimensions of 12 centimeters and 16 centimeters. The container is filled with a liquid. The mass of the liquid is 4.8 kilograms. Calculate the weight of the liquid. So to turn mass into a weight, we need to multiply by gravitational field strength, which uh, on Earth is 10. So we're going to get 48 newtons as a force. Calculate the pressure on the base of the container. So the whole weight of the liquid is going to be acting on the base of the container. And pressure is force divided by area. So we're going to do 48 divided by the base area, giving us 2,500 and the unit of pressure being pascals. But newtons per meter squared would be absolutely fine as well. Why would the total pressure on the base be greater than the value calculated? Well, this is the pressure due to just the liquid. There would also be the atmospheric pressure acting downwards, which would increase the overall pressure. OK, so the depth of the liquid in the container is 0.32 meters. Calculate the density of the liquid. Well, density is mass divided by volume. We know the mass is 4.8 kilograms, and we now can calculate the volume by multiplying the three dimensions together. That comes out as a number 781, but uh, the values here are all two significant figures, so we'd give it as 780 kilograms per meter cubed. Describe the movement of molecules in a solid. Well, molecules in a solid uh, stay in a pretty much fixed position, but they are still moving, they're still vibrating. In a gas, they are free to move, uh, but because they're free to move, they travel in straight lines and they will move in completely random directions and they'll do that at high speed. So a closed box contains gas molecules. Explain in terms of momentum how the molecules exert a pressure on the walls of the box. So first thing is the pressure is due to collisions between the gas particles and the container. So that's the source of the pressure. And the reason that a force acts on the wall is because a force acts on the molecules from the container wall. And the reason we know there's a force acting on it is because the momentum of the gas particles is changing. If the direction of the gas particles is changing, their momentum is also changing. They're both vector quantities. So that's the first key thing. The momentum of the gas particles changes. So Newton's second law tells us that the resultant force is equal to the rate of change of momentum or the momentum change per second, if you like. So each collision causes a force to act on the container. But there are lots of collisions happening in lots of different places, which is why we talk about pressure. So to get the pressure, we'll take the total force on the container and divide it by the area over which those collisions are spread. OK, so moving on to some optics, a ray of light in air is instant on a glass block and it changes direction. What is the name of that effect? Well, the one we're probably talking about is refraction. We could probably also talk about reflection here as well, but the one that we're probably looking for is refraction here. And the cause of that effect is the wave changing speed as it crosses the boundary. And it's the speed change that causes the refraction process. And that speed change is caused by density changes. OK, so we're going to draw a diagram to show a converging lens and it tells us it has a focal length of 3.5 centimeters. So we, the first thing we need to do is mark the two principal foci uh, with the letter F. So the principal focus will be one focal length away from the center of the lens in either direction. Uh, so those I've marked them with an X on here, will, those will be the principal foci. We've placed an object O as we can see and what we need to do is draw rays from the tip of the object to locate the image. So 
there are a couple of rules we can use to help us locate the image. The first one we can use is a lens will always focus parallel rays of light through the principal focus. So anything that goes in at that direction that we see here is going to go through the principal focus. The next rule we can use is that any ray that goes through the center of a lens is undeflected. And where those two lines intersect is where a focused image will be formed that we can draw there. The other one that we could use is a ray that goes through the principal focus to the lens will turn into a parallel ray of light like you can see, but we only need two rays of light to find the intersection, so we don't need all three. Okay, so to determine the height of the image, well, we just measure that from our diagram, and I reckon it's about 3.9 centimeters, but there's a range of possible values that you could, get, you could give around this value. So state and explain whether the image is real or virtual. Well, this image is going to be real because light rays actually go from the object to where the image is located. If it was a virtual image, no light rays from the object would actually go through the image. Okay. So moving on to look at some waves. So we've got some plane waves approaching a barrier. So draw three wave stunts on the right of the barrier for the first diagram. Well, we've got a gap size of similar size to the wavelength of the waves. So we're going to get uh, for the process of diffraction and they're going to spread out in all directions. So we're going to draw these semicircular waves, but the wavelength of them will not be affected. So the wavelength after the gap should be pretty much the same as the wavelength before. My diagram makes it look like they're a little bigger, but the wavelength should be the same. So the, on the bottom diagram, the gap is now much bigger than the wavelength. So what we should see here is that the waves that go through the gap should be undeflected. So we should have straight sections of waves about the length of the gap. And it's only at the edges uh, should we get any diffraction or direction change occurring. So it should bend at the corners or the edges, but it should be straight in those middle sections. Describe with a labeled diagram an experiment using water waves that shows reflection of wave fronts that occur a barrier. So usually we use a ripple tank to show wave fronts. So what we do is we have something to create plane waves that we send towards a barrier and then we can observe the reflected wave fronts. So how are we actually going to create the waves? Well, we'll, we'll as like I said, we'll use a ripple tank and we'll want to use a rectangular vibrator to create these plane waves or these straight waves. And we'll have those incident on a straight, we usually use a metal barrier, we might use a wooden one I guess, but metal is commonly used, and we can see we, the reflected waves. So how would we actually see this experiment? Well, we do two things to help us view it. We put a piece of white paper under the ripple tank, which is typically see-through, that helps us see it. And we usually put a strobe light over the top at the same frequency as the vibrator. Both of those things make it easier to observe the wave fronts. Okay, so state in terms of their structure, why metals are good conductors of electricity. Well. To be a good conductor, you need free, or the technical term would be delocalized electrons. And a, for a conductor, a typical value is one or two electrons per atom become free. It can be a bit more than that, it can be less, but that's a good ballpark figure. A cylindrical wire, we could call W1, has length L and cross-sectional area A. It has resistance of 16 ohms. A second cylindrical wire has half the length and double the area. And it's made from the same material. Determine the resistance of W2. So there's two pieces of information we need here. The resistance is directly proportional to length and resistance is inversely proportional to cross-sectional area. So halving the length is going to halve the resistance and doubling the area 
it's going to halve the resistance. So we're going to halve it twice, giving us a resistance of 4 ohms down from 16. So if we connect W1 and W2 in parallel, we need to use the reciprocal rule to calculate the total resistance. And then we flip it back over and that would calculate what the total resistance is, 3.2 ohms. And a good check at this point is we should find the resistance is less than either of the two parallel components, which you can see it is. Okay, so the pair of resistors is connected to a battery made from three cells. And they're in series with each other and it's implied from this, I think they're in the same direction. Each of them has an EMF E, and there's a current going through each resistor. State the EMF of the battery. Well, if they're in series and in the same direction, we just add them together, so we get 3E. The current through the battery is IB, the current through W1 is I1, current through W2 is I2. Tick the box to indicate the three currents. So with a parallel circuit, the biggest resistance is going to be in the battery. So it has to be one of the bottom three. And then in a parallel circuit, you get a bigger current through the smaller resistor. Now we know the smaller resistor is W2, so the current through it is going to be bigger than the current through W1. Okay. So in a laboratory at a normal room temperature, we've got 200 grams of water poured into a beaker. A thermometer is placed in the water, it has a reading of 22 degrees Celsius, very typical room temperature. Small pieces of ice at zero degrees are added to the water one by one. The mixture is stirred. You stir it because that means the uh, temperature of the water is pretty uniform throughout and after each addition of ice until the ice melt melts. The process is continued until the temperature recorded by the thermometer is zero degrees Celsius. The total mass of ice added to the water is found to be 60 grams. Specific heat capacity of water is 4.2 joules per gram. So we're going to need the mass in grams here because it's in joules per gram. Per degree Celsius. Calculate the energy lost by the water originally in the beaker. So we know the mass of water is 200 grams. The uh, heat capacity is 4.2 joules per gram per degree Celsius and we need to go from 22 to 0. So that we multiply those three numbers together that gives us our energy. Uh, we don't need to chain do anything any calculations including the mass of ice because the ice is already at zero degrees so assume that all the thermal energy lost by the water is transferred to the ice calculate the latent heat effusion of ice well uh, the equation we're going to use is q equals ml let's rearrange that to make l the subject we know the energy we know the mass of ice so we get our latent heat effusion and that mass is in grams so that's going to be in joules per gram suggest so a reason for any inaccuracy in the value well we're going to be exchanging thermal energy with the surroundings and more specifically thermal energy would come in from the surroundings because it's below room temperature and that's going to mean actually we're going to have used slightly too much ice in our calculations we'd have had to put in more ice than actually normal okay so we're going to look at demagnetizing a permanent bar magnet and a student suggests we place the magnet in a long coil, we put a large alternating current in the coil, switch off the current, and then remove the bar from the coil. State and explain whether the steps will always be able to demagnetize the magnet. And the key to this question is this word in here, always, which is where I think a lot of people went wrong with this. So the first thing people got wrong with this, apart from not, not really the always, is they said, well, it's a permanent magnet, you can't demagnetize it. And that's absolute rubbish. Um, anything that has been made to be a magnet or has been magnetized can be demagnetized. Permanent magnets are just quite difficult to demagnetize or we have to supply a lot of energy to demagnetize them. But it says in the question, we've got a large alternating current, so we are going to be able to demagnetize it. 
So the problem here is if the current is very, very big, that has a very strong magnetic field. And as we apply the alternating current, what's going to happen is it's just going to keep reversing the poles of the magnet. So as we apply an alternating current, what's going to happen is the poles will just flip like this. So if we put it in the field, it'll keep flip flopping. We turn off the current. We're just going to have a material that is still a magnet. It's still going to have poles. So what we actually need to do is as we apply the large alternating current, we slowly remove the material from the magnetic field. So what will happen is the part of a magnet when it's removed will still be aligned to the field at that time. And as we slowly pull it out, different parts of the magnet will be aligned in different directions. And so we've got all the dipoles or domains all aligned in different directions and we'll have demagnetized it. Now this is a slightly oversimplified version of this. It won't be this organized in reality, but this is why we need to slowly remove it so we actually uh, have the domains pointing in different directions. Okay, so we've now got the coil placed inside a magnetic field with a split ring commutator and connected to a DC power supply. What is the coil going to do? Well, the first thing I can see looking at this setup is the, the current is going to be coming out of the large side uh, of the battery. It's going to go to the right and round, and it's going to go um, in an anti-clockwise fashion around the coils of the magnet. So at the side of the coil nearest the north side of the magnet, the current is going to be coming out of the page. So my middle finger using Fleming's left hand rule is going to be coming out, uh, part, out of the page. The field is going from north to south. So that's going from left to right. So my thumb is pointing upwards. So this is going to make the coil rotate clockwise, which is one of the marking points here. So what's going to happen is the coil is going to rotate and it's going to be rotating continuously and it's going to rotate clockwise. And the reason it's going to do that is the two magnetic fields, the one from the stationary magnet and the one around the current carrying coil are going to uh, overlap with each other and that's going to produce the force. And the reason we have the split ring commutator is to reverse the current every half cycle so that the rotation keeps going in a constant direction. The coil in the diagram consists of three turns of wire. The magnetic field strength of the magnet is M and the current is 2. That produces a turning effect T. So the key piece of information I'm going to be using in this question is the turning effect is directly proportional to the number of turns, it's directly proportional to the strength of the magnet, and it's directly proportional to the current. So if we look at the first line, what we've done is we've multiplied the current by 4. All the others have stayed the same, so if current and turning effect are directly proportional, that's going to make 4 times the turning effect. It's the same thing with the number of turns. We've doubled the number of turns, kept everything else the same, so we'll have doubled the turning effect. And then this next one, we've kept the turns and current the same, we've halved the magnetic field strength, so that would halve the turning effect. All three of those properties are directly proportional. Okay, so explain why the voltage of a power supply to the primary coil of a transformer must be alternating. Well, we need the voltage to be alternating because we need an alternating current in the primary coil. And we need an alternating current because we need an alternating magnetic field in the iron core. So if we have an alternating magnetic field, that field is going to be cutting through the secondary coil and that's going to induce an EMF in the secondary coil and that's going to cause a current to flow and it's going to cause a current to flow fairly continuously in that secondary coil. Okay so we're going to look at some actual calculations now. So we've got 8,000 turns on the primary side. We don't know how many there are on the secondary side but we do know that the primary voltage is 240 and the secondary voltage is 6. So what we should know is that the 
turns ratio is the same as the voltage ratio. So the voltage ratio is going to be uh, is 40, so 240 divided by 6 is 40. So that means the turns ratio is 40 as well, which means N has to be 200. And we know it's going to be smaller than 8000 because we can see we've got a step down transformer here. It goes from 240 to 6. So we've got a step down transformer, so that tells us our N is a sensible value. So the current in the lamp is 2, so, and the transformer is 100% efficient. So 100% efficient means power in is equal to power out. So power out is calculated by doing the output current and the output voltage. So that's 12 watts. And the input must be equal to that. That's what 100% efficiency means. We know the input voltage, so that gives us the input current. OK, so the primary circuit contains a 2 amp fuse. Calculate the maximum number of uh, lamps that can be connected in parallel. So if we're in parallel, their currents are going to be adding together. So we're going to do 2 amps divided by the current for each lamp gives us 40 lamps to blow the fuse there. So really, I guess you could think about it, maybe we should be putting 39 here, because actually, well, we don't want to blow the fuse, so we need to stay under that 2 amp rating. Radon 222 is radioactive, and it can be represented with the nuclide notation 22286RN. For a neutral atom, radon 222 state the number of protons. Well, that smaller number there the, is the proton number, so 86. The number of neutrons is going to be the nucleon number, the 222, minus 86, so that's 136. It tells us the atom is neutral, which means the number of electrons is equal to the number of protons. Radon 222 de nucleus decays by alpha particle emission to polonium, PO. Complete the equation for the decay. So alpha decay produces a helium nucleus, which is two neutrons and two protons. So what we have to do is decrease the nucleon number by four and decrease the proton number by two, as you can see. Radon-222 has a half-life of 3.8 days. At a certain time, a sample contains 6.4 times 10 to the 6 radon nuclei. Calculate the number of alpha particles emitted following in the following 7.6 days. So the key is to realize that 7.6 days is two half-lifes. So after one half-life, there are going to be 3.2 times 10 to the 6 left. After another half-life, there are going to be 1.6 times 10 to the 6 left. But we want to know the number emitted. So we're going to do our original number minus the number left tells us there's 4.8 times 10 to the 6 emitted during that time. And that completes this uh, exam paper.